Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Sammy McElroy back to Superstar Speakers. Welcome, Sammy. How you doing? I'm very well, sir. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good, good, good. So the questions are already coming in, Sammy. You've been a, there's been a lot of um, love and build up to getting you on the show. There's a lot of people very, very excited about welcoming you to the show because you are a Manchester United legend. Um, what does it feel for you to be considered a legend and have the love of all the supporters for you this many years after retirement? Well, uh, to be honest, it's great to be to be liked by the supporters, but I think the word legend sometimes used a little bit freely. There's been some absolutely magnificent footballers at Manchester United, absolutely world class players, and uh, to be to be talked about as a legend sometimes it gives me a little bit of embarrassment, really. But uh, <laughs> it's fantastic to be 13 years at Old Trafford. I've had some great times there. And the fact you are remembered. So if you um, you say you're about being a legend, let's have someone here who's going to knock you right back down to earth because our good old friend Norman Whiteside has um, tweeted in and he says, um, you're a top man, a Man United and Northern Ireland great, but he always let you win at snooker. So this is your opportunity, Sammy, to um, either agree or disagree with that statement from Big Norm. Well, let me tell you, I won more than what I lost. Let's be honest. I always, when I used to work at hospitality, I used to go to certain boxes and people would say, oh, Big Norman done you again. We used to play every Wednesday for years until the big man hurt his neck. And they used to tell everyone that he's always beaten me. And let me, I'll, I'll tell you, to be honest, that was very, very rare that he beat me. <laughs> very rare. So he's another big man on Twitter then. He's a big man behind the keyboard. We're hoping to get him on at some point, to be honest with you. You will. You'll get him on and I'll, I'll send him a lovely tweet as well. Don't worry. Please do. Please, <laughs> please do. Um, another former colleague of yours we had on recently was Keith Gillespie. And he had nothing but praise for you um, when he was playing under you at Northern Ireland. What are your memories of yeah. Keith? Uh, Keith is fantastic, lad. Great character. I have a soft spot for Keith. Um he used to get in loads of bother, to be honest with you. And I used to help him out at times. And uh, But one thing he did for me, he was great on the field for me. He was probably one of my most consistent players alongside David Healy yeah. um, for, for the goals. But Keith Keith did a great job for me. And he was a great fella off the, uh, off the park as well. He liked to gamble. He liked to drink. Still does, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I made up with him and the old boys when we played games together and he, he hasn't changed he's a fantastic lad great kid he's a good fellow we like keith on the show um a couple of questions are coming in there so any great questions that come in i'm just going to pop them in randomly Lindsay rowe um asks out of all of the managers you played for who got the most out of you and who was your favorite and if you want to say who was your least favorite um i've, I've played under some great managers at old Trafford, as you can imagine um, mm -hmm. you know a little bit under some Matt early days and uh, Franco Farrell um, gave me my debut against Manchester City. But um, I think of, of the long run, I think Tommy Doherty was probably the manager to change things around for me. Um, started off as a striker, then went back into midfield when we bought Jimmy Greenough from Stoke and things started to kick on from there. So uh, Tommy Doherty was probably... Uh, the one that, that probably got the most out of me, I would say. What was so special about Tom? What was his management style like in comparison to um, some, of the, some of the others that you worked with? Hey, well, he, he loved football. He, he, was a, he was a bit of a character. There's no doubt about that. He, he, uh, you know, we, we played hard and, yeah. and, and we lived hard, if you know what I mean, because uh, Tommy liked the drink. He liked the joke. Um, Attacking, very attacking team. He bought the wingers back, the old trapper, brought the flare back when it was a little bit of a doldrum after the relegation. And Tommy was the main man to bring all those uh, players to the club. And for about three three years, maybe three and a half years, since we get back into the first division, as it was called in them days, we, we were playing some fantastic football. Uh, beat Liverpool in the Cup in 77. Uh, 76 we lost at Wembley finished third in the league so things were on the up until Tommy obviously um, had that affair with, uh, with, with Mary Brown and, and eventually got the sack but right up until that times were good 
Um, another thing has just come back into my mind, actually. We're talking about Keith Gillespie. He was talking a lot about the Northern Ireland job and Northern Ireland potentially, what, being two games away from getting to the European Championships, which will be next year now. Um, in yeah. your experience, what's the allure of the Northern Ireland job and what's the country and the team need in a manager right now? Well, I think, well, obviously, I mean, uh, the, the Northern Ireland job, to be honest with you, I think it goes in cycles. Uh, when you look at back to, I made my debut 72, 71, 72 season for Terry Neal, who was a manager. We had no success whatsoever. We were getting beat no matter who we played. We travelled all over the world, didn't get many great results. Um, and then along come 1980, Billy Bingham comes for his second spell. And all of a sudden, from 1980 to 1986, we have a fantastic run. Two World Cups. We won yeah. the British Championship. And things happened for Billy Bingham. I think that squad that he got together and added to in those six years, seven years, was absolutely fantastic. We were like a club side, not an international side. We had some fantastic characters. And Big Norman, uh, you know, became a part of that that uh, that squad and, that, and, and around about that time since 1982 when the big man came in. And uh, we had some great times. We had some, uh, as I say, we, we we played like a club side. Everyone got on together. You know, we had that motto, win or lose, have a booze. And that's what we did. We were absolutely, uh, we, we lived every moment of it, especially the World Cups. Um, Stevie Park has just asked us a question regarding the World Cups, actually. and said, what is your best achievement as a player? Northern Ireland 82 World Cup run, 77 FA Cup win, or taking Man United back into the top division where they belong in 1975. Or yeah, well, another... they're all. Yeah, they're all. They're all obviously you, you know memorable moments in your career when um, you know beating Liverpool 77 was fantastic. They were a great side going for the treble. We stopped that, which was great. Um, but obviously for Northern Ireland, you know, to get to the World Cup, only like over a million people or whatever in Northern Ireland, and for us to actually qualify. Not just for 82, 86 as well was, was an unbelievable achievement, I think. And uh, that, you know, that along and live in my memory. Um, also, uh, I have to say about my debut against Manchester City, 71 72, playing in place of Dennis Law, who was injured. Franco Farrell was a manager. That was, that was a great time for me. Didn't know till the Saturday morning that I would have been playing. Um, no mobiles in those days, obviously. Couldn't tell my family, couldn't tell anyone that I was going to play in that debut. And uh, everything worked out a three. Great game, 3-3. Three, three. Happened to score a goal that day, which was great as well. Can't ask for more than that. Scoring a goal in a derby against like against the derby team on your debut, that's not a bad way to start a career, is yeah. it? They were a great side as well, Man City at the time. You know, they had great Bell, Lee, Summerby, uh, mm-hmm. Meg Doyle, Alan Oaks. They were a good side. They were, they were, they were really... Uh, Hard to say the beat and the flower side as well in those days. It was great to make my debut against them. And I'm guessing as well, there's always that little bit extra. The game gets raised when it's a derby as well, because there's a lot more importance in it, isn't there? Well, them days, uh, yeah. going back to the 70s, from the Monday to the Friday, it was in the paper every day. Mm-hmm. Manchester Evening News, in the paper every day. The build-up players having to go at one another, especially the late Meg Doyle at Man City. He slaughtered every player in the paper from Monday to Friday. We played for United, and then in the after the game, we'd all be in the bar having a drink together. And Brilliant. That's that's the way it was, and the the rivalry though for the supporters was intense in those days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's a different thing now, isn't it? Like supporters are a little bit more loose in their affiliation, aren't they? You get your diehards, but you don't get that local community of supporters as you used to. No, no, I think I think that's gone now. I mean, obviously, yeah. Uh, with a lot of foreign players coming into the game, which obviously the majority are very, very good. Uh, but in those days, there was, was no foreigners at all. It was probably a lot of local lads yeah. who were playing in the, in the derbies. And uh, that, made it, that made it great for the supporters and great for the players because if you lost the derby game, you, you didn't want to go out that weekend. You, you no. were in hiding. Oh, you were in hiding because every t- everywhere you went out, you got beat. People would be saying, what was going on? What went wrong? And you didn't want to be in that situation. <laughs> I mean, football fans have got long memories, haven't they? <laughs> they oh, don't forget no. these things. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, they, everyone looked out for when we're playing Man City and, you know, we're home and away. And uh, 
the build-up was fantastic. <laughs> Another question's come in um, from Brian, pretty similar to the last one. Um, what is your best achievement and most disappointing moment in your football career? If I can kind of answered that, but there's anything else you can add to it for Brian, that'd be great. Well, obviously, you, you know, your, your memories of, of winning things, uh, winning the FA Cup for United, you know, we, we wanted to win the, the, the first division take as it was in those days. And the best we did in, the, in May day was finish second to Liverpool, which happened quite quite a lot, you know. And um, uh, disappointment was actually leaving United uh, when I did. I left under a little bit of a cloud. The manager at the time was Big Ron Atkinson, um, who we had a little bit of a fallout at the time. And um, I sort of rushed, stupidly rushed, to leave when I shouldn't have done, but uh, that was down to to Big Ron really, in our sort of words together. The reason why I did leave. Oh, okay. Um, so getting back to that question, sorry, earlier on before, best manager or the most manager got people out of me, Tommy Duck. Probably the worst I played on there was Big Ron. I don't think we'll go into um, the whys of that. Let's keep this light. <laughs> yeah, it's quite weird because no you had things. Yeah, I think that's a good move to move straight. I'm talking of great managers, though, which leads perfectly into this. Lindsay, again, um, you're labelled as the last of the Busby babes. It must be fantastic to have that link to the club. Are you proud? Because it's, if I'm right in saying, uh, Matt Busby's last sign-in at Manchester United. Like that, that's a hell of a badge of honour, isn't it? Well, I was, and to be honest, I mean, I know Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay's a lovely man. I know him very, very well. Uh, I didn't really know about that side for a number of years while I was at Old Trafford, believe it or not, mm -hmm. uh, until I started obviously playing in the side, playing quite regular, that I was actually told that uh, I was from Matt's last professional signing. Um, and obviously being under a fantastic manager like him, um, what he did for the club and the players he brought through and the, the way he played the game. It was fantastic, and I love that sort of tag now at the moment that I was his last professional sign, and he can't get any better than that for me. No, not at all. It's a wonderful thing. Um, something we talk about on the show a lot is the comparison between the Busby Babes and the class of 92. You've got these two great generations that came through yeah. the rank. Do you think um, we'll see another strong class come through? Because it's about time, don't you think? that? And there's a great youth system there at United. Well, that's what I said. I mentioned before about cycles, about how, the, how, the, how these come along and you get a batch of players that actually come in certain times. And uh, hopefully, as you say, there is some very, very good young players at Manchester United at the minute. And to be fair to Solskjaer, he has brought a lot through yes. onto, on, onto the team at the moment. And they all look capable of, uh, with experience and with games, they're going to get better. And I think there's a few there, maybe four or five at the minute, that are really going to be fantastic players many, many years at the club. I can see them if they just keep doing what they're doing at the moment. I think there's a batch there that could come through. Yeah, I mean, we Daniel James is one of them. Um, it's Brandon Williams yeah. at the as well is looking. Yeah. Like, not many people talk about Williams, but he's looking really good. And I would even include, I know he's not homegrown, but Wamba Saka is a young lad and he's looking solid at the back as well. So, I mean, is there any other name yeah. you can add to that or... Any advice that you would well, give any of these young guys? Well, I mean, you, you've mentioned Williams. Are for me, he's been he's been an unbelievable this season. The games he's played. Yeah, uh, McTomley for me has come on leaps and bounds. True, he has come on leaps and bounds. And um, you know, I, when I first seen the boy, I'd, I'd seen him uh, in the academy teams, and, and I've, I'm watching him, and I'm thinking, yeah, he's got something, but is he going to burst through? And he has he has really took his chance and grabbed it. And uh, I th actually think we missed him when he was injured, um, McTomley, and he's back in the side now. And he's, you know, you've got you've got little players like, uh, you know, Gomez, you've got uh, other players, Garner. Uh, you've got some, uh, you know, players that are looking that they're going to get their chance on their, on their alley. And uh, that's always been the, the, the case at United. Age was never a problem. If you're good enough, Every manager at the time when I was there threw you in. Take your chance. Can you play in front of 70,000 people? Come on, show me. That's the way it is. And that's how these young players are tested these days, by doing that. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, when you're young, you're not frightened of anything, are you? If you're a 16-year-old professional footballer, you're not frightened of 70,000 people, surely? 
Well, sometimes you see you, you, you get the training player who looks unbelievable in training. He's playing with the boys. He's looking really fantastic. He's, he's doing everything right. Then you throw him out in front of 50, 60, 70,000 people and some actually can't handle it. Some actually freeze, you know. And um, I, I've seen some players in my time even come to the club from another club and they were fantastic at that other club. Then they come to United and they don't show that same sort of, uh, I don't know what, it, I, I can't really say what it is, but there seems to be a little bit of fear because the expectations at United are so high. Maybe they weren't the same at that other club where they were at. I mean, it is one of the biggest clubs in the country. And I'm saying that I'm sitting here as a Newcastle fan, but it is one of the biggest clubs in the country, both historically and at the moment. So you do have to raise your game, don't you, to go and play for Man United, like you said. Well, as I say, that's gone back. That goes back to some match days. That goes back to, to them when the way he played the game, attack, 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 which was fantastic. I mean, you know, I, every United side I've been in, it's all about if they score two, we get three. That's that's the way it was, and um, you know, and your expectations. It, so Matt always used to say the little bit I had with some Matt was, "Hey, listen, go and entertain these people, these supporters who have been working all week. They yes. want to go and see a great game, plenty of goals, plenty of excitement. Don't let them down." And uh, you know that's fantastic. And you know, Tommy Doherty was a little bit like that. Um, you know, if you win, you've got to win well. Make sure you go out and entertain. Don't leave anything on the field. Leave it going. They score two, we get three. That was the motto. Go and do that, which was great. I like that because like football does mean a lot to the people of Great Britain, doesn't it? It's a very, very p passionate thing that we have. And there's a lot of men and women out there that their, their week revolves around that game. So if you're watching rubbish football or people that aren't putting in the effort, all of a sudden... yeah. You're paying their wages, aren't you, effectively? Well, uh, that's right. I mean, people save up. Look at United like, at the moment. United have got support all over the world, yes. all over the country, all over Britain, Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland, Scandinavia, everywhere now, Far East, everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you know, what you just said there, they, they save their money, they book games, they travel for 24, 25 hours, some of them. So they want to be entertained. And... Um, the last couple of managers, I'm not talking about uh, Ali, I'm talking about maybe Mourinho and Van Hal. I don't think the excitement was there. That's my opinion. Even though we won trophies under those two managers, I don't think the excitement was there the way it was like in my day and before me. I think the supporters actually realised that as well, that the excitement wasn't there. Yeah. I mean, I always, the difference between Ferguson and Mourinho, Ferguson would love a creative player or like a Maverick, like a Cantona or a Ronaldo or um, someone like that. Whereas Mourinho wanted identikit footballers all the way through. And he didn't want that, that Maverick, that creativity coming where he couldn't control it. it was just my take on things anyway. Just that's not a Man United style of football. No, not at all. And I totally agree yeah. with what you say there. I think I think under Mourinho, we were organised, don't get me wrong, but yeah. if we were winning 1-0, that would be enough for him. That would be enough for him. Where, like Fergie, Shamat, Tommy Doc, we would would want more goals and entertain the fans. And I think the fans missed that for a couple of seasons. Absolutely right. Let's go back to the questions, because obviously that's what we're here for, really, the interaction. Owen Parks, um, what stadium has the best atmosphere that you played at during your career? That's a good question. Um, I've played, obviously, in a lot of stadiums. And um, I used to like the old White Hart Lane. Um, that used to be fantastic atmosphere. Great mm -hmm. games against Spurs and our dead. Used to be plenty of goals. Um, going back to the old Allen Road Leeds as well. That was a, that, that was a ground where you can get uh, a great atmosphere. Actually, mostly hatred, to be honest with you. But <laughs> um, you know, and uh, those games, uh, even even Main Road, the old Main Road, uh, the atmosphere because of the the game, the derby, you could hear the crowd and uh, and the electricity about the place. Those few grounds that I've mentioned was always... Uh, Anfield as well was another one with a cop and the United fans in the, getting together. Th those grounds were fantastic to play in. They're big rivalries, though. You've got Liverpool, City and Leeds. They're big Man United rivalries. Does that give you an massive, extra push massive. when you're playing? Like, does that help you? Oh, um... massive. I mean, 
Uh, well, it, it, it does help you, but we go back to the 70s in our time. We, we would do well against Liverpool in the Cups, but we just can't, weren't consistent enough in the league to sort of push them all away. And that yeah. was a bit of a, a disappointment, really, because in the Cup ties, semi-finals, we beat them. We beat them in the 77 Cup final. We beat them in other finals, you know. And, uh, you know, we, we, we did sort of well in one-off games. But uh, Liverpool, we wanted their consistency in league football. Yeah. Winning that championship, that's what we wanted in, in, in my day. Unfortunately, it didn't come. But the rivalry now, maybe more with Liverpool, and what it is with Manchester City, believe it or not, the way it's gone over the last few years. I think you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely a wonderful person to talk to because you keep leading into the next question when Carl has asked, should Liverpool be awarded the Premier League? That's a good question, Carl, because <laughs> uh, obviously they're odds on favourites. Two games to go. They're going to do it. They're going to win it. It's took them 30 years to do it, but they're going to do it. Um it looks like we're going to play it behind closed doors and they'll get their two wins. And uh, the only thing is we'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> Just before we came on, I was listening to um, Jamie Carragher and apparently every morning, Gary Neville just sends him an asterisk just because like it's a tainted win every single day. Um I Liverpool, I was talking about massive clubs. Liverpool are one of the biggest clubs in the country. I know there's a rivalry there, but... It's quite nice to see two teams, they're going to just keep getting making each other better. Whereas Man United had their period of dominance. When you've got another team that can push them, they're going to get better and better. So everyone wins, don't they? Well, it, it, you, you want competition. I, I yeah. agree with what you're saying there. And over the last couple of years, to be honest with you, Liverpool and Manchester City have set a bar. Liverpool and City have set that bar. Um they have just sort of sneaked away a little bit. Okay, you could talk about money, but at yeah. the end of the day, you've got to buy the right players. And I think, especially Klopp recently has bought bought very well. Um, I think he had to he had to strengthen where he did strengthen, and that's been the reason why they have overtook City for me. Um, but Manchester City for the last few years have been the side, you know, to. Uh, to sort of try to get near, and Liverpool have done that. Now Liverpool have sort of overtook them. So we have got to keep Manchester United now, have got to get right on them two clubs' tails and yeah. get where we belong. And if we have to spend the money, we're going to have to do it. Doesn't matter mm. how much, because the money's there at Old Trafford. We've got to get these best players and keep up with those two clubs. But it definitely we can't let them like... get further away. We can't no, let no, them not get further all... away. <laughs> You'll never hear the end of it. No. Stevie Park asks, who is the best player you played alongside and who was the hardest defender you played against? Well, obviously, uh, I, played, I played alongside some fantastic footballers at Manchester United, but obviously, my old Northern Ireland uh, mate, uh, Best, his name's right, George Best was the best I've, uh, I've ever seen, ever played with. And I've played with some fantastic players at Manchester United over the years some great players, but best in them days, in the way the soccer was in those days, with you're playing against players who would kick their granny, Norman Hunter, Tommy Smith, Ron Harris, oh, yeah. Big John McGrath. You know, it was frightening to see what bestie, the stick that he took. And um, he got up like a rubber ball, rubbed himself down and went for the next one, you know. Uh, but he... He, he had everything. He could head it, left foot, right foot, tackle, score, make a goal. He could do everything. And um, it's unfortunate that, you know, he didn't have that sort of little bit more. And even get to one of our World Cups in 1982, we tried to get him on that, which unfortunately we couldn't. But it would have been great for a player of his calibre to be in a World Cup. Unfortunately, he didn't do that. Hard players who have played against, as I said, I've mentioned a few there. Tommy Smith, uh, Norman Hunter, Ron Harris. But there was one player, and he was only a young lad, that I can always remember uh, when I come up against him. Uh, it was a lad called Kevin Beattie, who used to be at Ipswich. Kevin Beattie. And he had to retire through injury. I think it was a cartilage. He had something like three or four bad cartilage operations, and he finished up, finished them completely. But he would have had, for me, 
seriously, 100 caps for England, if he had been fit and well and able, he was an unbelievable uh, sort of a wing back at the time. Yeah. But he could head it, he could tackle, he was strong as an ox. But injury seen him off. But he, he would have been a fantastic player. Um, going back to George Best being your teammate, did you ever go for a beer with George Best? I, I, I was lucky enough, well, I say lucky enough, um, to be with him on a couple of occasions. And uh, as I say, he was he was a, he was a very generous man. And uh, he actually bought me a bottle of champagne after my debut game against Man City in 1971-72. Best, he said, if I score a goal that day, I'll give you a bottle of champagne. And on the Monday, he brought it in, to be fair. And I didn't. I, couldn't, I hadn't got the bottle to tell him I didn't like champagne, but um, <laughs> I kept it for about I kept it for about eight to ten years because George gave it me, and uh, uh, he was he, he was he was great, very witty, very very generous, very witty, generous man, and um, yeah, great some great stories I could tell you about George. Well, feel free to do it. We have the platform. We're more than unless this is a um, <laughs> when we do the Man United Legends tour, we'll do it behind the scenes. Is it one of them? <laughs> No, not really, not really. I tell you, there's a true story about George, a true one. Um, 1971-72, I made my debut, as I said to you, for Man United. And on the February, um, my first game was for Northern Ireland. I got called into the Northern Ireland squad uh, to play Spain in the European Championship. But we had to go to Hull uh, for my debut because we couldn't play in Belfast because of the troubles at the time. People were shooting one another, and Windsor Park was closed. We couldn't we couldn't go back there. Teams wouldn't go back there. So Terry Neal was the manager, and um, he played player manager for Hull City, Boothbury Park, as he called it them there. So my first game was uh, down there in Hull. So on that Saturday night, we played Spurs at Old Trafford on the Saturday. On that Saturday night, I was out in Manchester. And we were reporting for Northern Ireland on the Sunday, me and George. And I seen George out on Saturday night in this bar. And I went and spoke to him and said, blah, blah, blah. And he said, listen, tomorrow we'll get the train down the hole, nine o'clock train. He says, I'll get the tickets. Make sure you're there. No problem. I'll see you. Oh, George, that's brilliant. I'll see you at the, the station in the morning, get the nine o'clock to the hole. So I was dead excited. Went home that night. Got up. I got to the station at half past eight, waited for George, 20 to nine, no George, 10 to nine, no George. I thought I better get myself a ticket. So I got a ticket, went to Hull, best he turned up Tuesday for the game. <laughs> of, uh, you know, and, uh, Terry Neal was the manager and he was, on the Wednesday morning, he was going to have a meeting to see if the lads wanted George to play because um, he didn't turn up with the rest of the lads. But he turned up Tuesday, bestie, with this beautiful woman called Caroline Moore, Miss Great Britain. He Good brought her boy. to the hotel. <laughs> and um, he came to me after dinner and said, listen, Sammy, I'm so sorry. He said, I woke up Sunday, every intention of going to see you at the station, but I looked at her in bed and I thought, I may as well stay here. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. And uh, he played that game, my debut. We drew with Spain 1-1. And uh, that, that's the way it happened. Uh, I got down the hall on, on my own. Enjoy the game <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> Do you know what? In hindsight, you can't really blame him, can you? In all fairness. <laughs> I don't, oh, think, that... I, I don't think anyone could blame him. Actually. Nah. You know, but uh, that's just the way, that's the way he was. That's the way he was. That, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for that. That was brilliant. <laughs> All right, Colin Park has a question. Um, how hard was the decision to switch to City, and do you regret it? Um, well, I went to Stoke City from from United. I just told that story before. I hastily went to Stoke, and Stoke was a lovely place. Don't get me wrong; the lovely supporters treated me very, very well. When Stoke got relegated, Billy McNeil was the manager of Manchester City at the time. Uh, Johnny Giles was at West Brom and um, Johnny Giles wanted me to go to West Brom to have a chat with him but Billy McNeil uh, a big friend of Paddy Creran um, and Paddy, Re Paddy recommended me to Billy McNeil to go and meet Billy McNeil and, and go to Manchester City which I did um, 
I actually scored him a debut for Manchester City, but I get booed in the warm-up, believe it or not. Every time I warmed up for Manchester City, when my name was called out, they booed me because the last Busby Babe or whatever what it was, um, things didn't happen for me at Main Road. Plus the fact, though, on a serious note, I had a bit of an Achilles problem at the time, which I needed three operations, um, which didn't really help me. So things didn't really work out at City. But it was the place to go. I wanted back in Manchester. Manchester City had just come up from the second division. And Billy McNeil, when I talked to him, seemed to love the game and love football. And I thought this could be OK, but it just didn't work out. That's what you don't know till you get there, do you, I guess? Um, I want to ask your opinion, Sammy, because... Yeah, you have um, to try it. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I suppose it's worse when a club doesn't want you. And Man City's always been a big club. Like it'd be worse if they didn't want you, wouldn't it? Surely. Uh, You've got to go yeah, to the big I, club. I had to, go, I, I had to go. I was back in Manchester where I wanted to be. And uh, yeah. as you say, just didn't happen. I want to ask your opinion on this man because we have got five dates with Roy Keane coming up across the UK and Ireland. Um, could you tell us anything about your thoughts, opinions, or if you've ever crossed paths with um, with Roy Keane, please? Well, I'll tell you something. It won't be a dull moment, will there? No. <laughs> I, can't, I can't see that happening. I've never really come across Roy Keane, to be honest with you. I've, I've admired him as a footballer. Don't get me wrong. Forget his uh, outstanding views, whatever. Looking at him as a footballer, yeah. I admire him as a footballer. Um, great player, box to box, gives 100% and um, did very, very well for Manchester United. Uh, no doubt about that. Um, and, uh, you know, had a, well, had, a, had a good career, obviously, at Manchester United. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's one of those type of blokes. He'll speak his mind. If he doesn't like you, you'll know that. And uh, if he gets on with you, you'll have a good time. So let's let's hope he likes you. <laughs> well, I have met him before, but whether he remembers me or not might be a different thing. I kind of um, yeah. tend to slip into the background at shows, to be honest with you. Yeah. Do your homework, um, I think. Do your homework before you speak to him. Oh, my lord. There's like, any error whatsoever, and I'm getting flattened in front of thousands of people, like just like that yeah. as well. And I'm not going to argue Absolutely. with him because I will lose. Absolutely. No. <laughs> No, it should be good fun because he'll definitely speak his mind. Well, the other side of it is I might not get a word in edgeways. <laughs> I might be like that. True, true. true. Uh, That'll be worth going to see. Thank you very much for that. A big question from Aaron Cully. He says, Sammy, can I have a shout out, please? Can he just, what? Can he have a shout out? Just say hello to Aaron. <laughs> How you doing, Aaron? Up the Reds. He... <laughs> Carl Widowstone's been on again. Um, will United benefit from teams struggling with finances following the lockdown? Could they cherry pick some players? Well, it's going to be interesting to see exactly how that happens because, I mean, this what's happening at the moment, um, teams are going to struggle for money and there's going to be a lot of players out of work, a lot of players out of contract. Um, whether, whether United... And by the way, I think we do need to buy players, even though Ollie has turned it around a little bit and we are on the right direction. I still think we need added to the squad and hopefully we get the players that we do need. Yeah. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see how managers and clubs and chairman and owners of clubs actually let the money go. Uh, because this has hit so many clubs, this virus, it's going to be mm -hmm. interesting to see exactly where these transfer fees actually go from now on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you said about buying more players and plugging some gaps in the team, where would you, where do you think the gaps are? Where do you think we should buy players and possibly who should we buy to put in them places? I think I always look at the side and I always look, if you go right down to Spain, say if you get another, uh, I mean, I think all these buys have been quite good, to be honest with you. Uh, the ones he's brought in, I think they've been good players, good signings. I would take another command and centre half. Uh, I would take another if we could get a goal scoring midfield player. And, and you can always do with another striker, even though, as I say, you know we've got we've got some young kids coming through there, the Greenwoods, the Rashfords, people like that who are scoring goals. I don't know about this boy uh, Ogala from what he's going to do with Chenna. I don't know. 
but I would get another prominent goal scorer, regular goal scorer. They're talking about the boy Sancho from Dortmund. I think I think he would be a great asset, but we're talking again about the money. Can we go that far to get him? That's another question. But people like that, right down to Spain, I think uh, that would really improve us. What What's your take on the Pogba situation then? What would you do with Pogba if you were the boss? God, I mean, Pogba's a player. We all know he's a player. Yeah. We all know um, he's... Uh, he can do it. Um, I just need them to be more consistent. I need them to do more, as I say, commanding, winning games against the big clubs, taking a grip of a game, showing what he can do the way he did for France in the World Cup. He's a World Cup winner. He's yeah. a fantastic footballer. But I just think sometimes in games he needs to show the fans, I, I can do a trick, I can do this, I can do that. Forget that. Just keep the ball going, show what you can do score more goals, box to box. He can do that. And that's what we need from Pogba, just more consistent. If he wants to be here, by the way, he's got to want to be here. If he doesn't want to be here, get him to Real Madrid up the road and let's get someone else who wants to be here. Well, he must have quite a high value at the moment. Like we were saying the other week with um, Gillespie, that you've got the Euros coming up. He's going to want regular football, so he's fresh and ready for the Euros when they're coming up next year. Surely... There needs well, to be a left had... Yeah, absolutely. He's only had six games. He hasn't had many games this season. Now he's fit and able now. When we get when when we start playing again, um I'm sure, I really am sure. I think Ollie will throw him right in. I really do. I think Ollie will put him right right back in the midfield. Yeah. Um and um he's got to show now to the end of the season how many games we've got left. He's got to show if he wants to be here. That's what I think. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. When you've got a player like that, though, where you don't know if they want to be there or not, and they seem to be getting away with murder, what are his teammates going to be thinking of that mentality? And like, are they going to be trying to push him on, or are they going to be getting frustrated? Like, what's it like to have someone well, like that in the locker room? See, what we need, we've just mentioned a King. We need a Roy King. We need a Brand Robson. We need somebody yeah. in there just to have a word with him, or, or the old say, maybe grab him. Uh, by the throat or something, and just shake them and say, "Hey, come on, show us what you can do. Don't be, don't be messing about. Don't be, don't be fannying around. Come on." And I think a Robson or a Keane in this present day, but there's none of them about now. There's no. no I look at every team. There's no characters. There's no what you call uh, hard men characters who can play as well and get the best out of other players. Uh, that's just the way the game's gone now. Uh, but in the '70s, there was plenty of them. 80s, 90s, there was plenty of them, but there's not now. And I think yeah. somebody like that would get the best out of a Pogba. Would it definitely shake him up, put it like that? Yeah, I think it needs it because I know myself. I mean, obviously, I've never played football to a high standard by any stretch. That's how I got a job talking about it rather than playing it. But, um, you know, in any team or any working environment, you need a boss who's just going to say, when you're not pulling your weight, come on. Like, I'd expect my boss to do exactly. it. In this job. Exactly, 100%. 100%. You've, you've got your manager who, who does the team talks, who, who picks the team, who organises how you play. But you need somebody out there, not necessarily your captain, but you need somebody out there who's going to be one of those where everyone respects. Yeah. The way everyone respected a Robson, a King, and say, right, come on. Hey, you're not pulling your weight here. You're going to get a kick up the backside if you don't. And, and you you need somebody like that at, at Manchester United. You know? But unfortunately, I don't think there is any these days. No, I think you're absolutely right. I had this conversation again recently. Like, you're not having, like, say, characters or mavericks. Like, you're George Best is a prime example of it. Paul Gascoigne, a prime example of it. These men who are just a little bit wired and woolly around the edges doing all of these crazy things outside of the pitch, but delivering on the pitch. We've just seemed to have lost that that personality in football. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Totally agree with you. Th those type of players, they could win a game. They could yeah. win you a game out of nothing. Uh, Fleur players, a little bit of magic. And uh, yeah, you're dead right. There's not many of them. Well, no. I'm scratching my head to think there was any about today. But uh, there was plenty Ronaldo, of Ronaldo, maybe, at a push. Ronaldo, Messi. 
Ronaldo, Messi, probably two of the best players in the world. Yeah. They can win a game on their own. Well, Ronaldo won the Euros for Portugal on his own pretty much, didn't he? Well, uh, well, I mean, it's it's unbelievable, you know, uh, what he and, and, and Messi uh, yeah. have achieved, you know. Um, people look up to them, and rightly so. Young kids look up to them, and, and um, you know, for what they've achieved in the game today, the modern game today, they're up there. Very much so. Where do you stand on who's better, Sammy? Everyone's got an opinion. I tell you what, and, and, and the opinions divided as well. By the way, for me, believe it or not, they're different players. Yeah. Ronaldo can do things Messi can't do. Messi can do things Ronaldo can't do. Ronaldo can score every type of goal you want in the head. Messi don't get many headers, but Messi can beat people yeah. four, five, three, whatever. Where maybe Ronaldo can't. But Ronaldo's strength is still he's he, what is he middle thirties coming up, and he's so fit. Yeah. Um, and he's still scoring goals. The two of the goals, the records are, are they're unbelievable. But, you know, uh, as I say, divided. Uh, who would have liked watching? Who would have liked maybe watching my type of player? I think Messi, slightly Messi, because of how he beats people, how he can create the goals he scores. Uh, it's close, very, very close. So always, I'm mean, so lucky just to have the two of them. In, in my, I mean, I'm 39 year old, and I always say it, I've never seen two players that good, yet alone at the same time. Absolutely, and, and when, when you look at the, the European Player of the Year awards lately, I think they've shared it between the two of them over the last so many years. Pretty they're much, yeah. close. <laughs> uh, absolutely, they're that close. And going back to the questions then, Owen Parks, kind of um, on the subject we're talking about is, do you think the dressing room nowadays is as tight and as fun as it was in your day when players were closer together and not worried so much about the money? It's a good question. I, no, I, again, I go back to my day and uh, we had some we had some characters in, in, in our squad when we had some fun. We had more of a bit of a social life after games where we could all go together and have a drink, where these players can't do that now. They might have a lot more money than what we have, but I don't think they can enjoy it the way that we used to do on the social side of things. Because of press, now media, they're, they're, they're after you. Every mistake they make, they're on you. Yeah. We had a little bit of leeway in our day where we could have a drink after the game all together. Um, well, we used to have a players' lounge at Old Trafford after games. I don't think they have that now. Um, or we used to go and have a drink after the games, mingle with supporters. I don't think you can do that now. So, obviously, people say to me, would you take the money? Of course I would. Of course I would take the money. But I played in, a, for me, a great era where I played against characters and uh, and the social side and everything was, was great to be involved with. You're right in what you say as well, like mingling with the supporters. Every supporter's got a camera on them now and access to the entire world. So say you meet someone, you have one too many drinks, they can take pictures of you. And before you know it, that's across the across the country, across well, the world. I don't think that's I don't think that's yeah, I don't think that's right as well. I mean, that's a little bit of a liberty now, but you're so right. All these mobile phones now with cameras, uh people can take a photograph of, of a player having a drink at a bar. He might even just have one drink. Yeah. But the paper says it's ten drinks, and that's what the sort of press that they're looking for now, which which is wrong. If they had said ten drinks in our day, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we we could get away with it. That's fantastic. That's fantastic, Stevie Park. Um, what would you fetch in today's market, and how much would George Best be worth? Oh my God! Uh, <laughs> well, talking about bestie, if they're talking about the young kid Sancho, a hundred million. Oh my God! You couldn't put a price on bestie. You couldn't put a price on him with, with money these days. Whatever the record would be, it would be for bestie, yeah. without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, oh, I don't know about myself. I, I don't know uh, what figures. Well, I don't know. I think that, that that would be up to supporters or somebody to 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 judge what I'd be worth. But uh, I I I wouldn't know what to say about myself to be honest with you. 
It's very humble of you. I always find that's a strange question because the value of a player in hindsight is obviously a lot better than picking the player at the right time so you get the benefit of that career. Do you know what I mean? Saying George Best is worth 250 million is great because we know what he was yeah. achieved. But you have to pick these young players before they achieve it almost. It's it's a very difficult well, question. Exactly. Exactly. And that's that's so well put from yourself there because when you think about the young boy Sancho, he yeah. was at Manchester City as a kid. Mm -hmm. Manchester City let him go to Dortmund. All of a sudden, he's done unbelievably well, got into the England squad. Now we're talking 100 million and his yeah. career still is in front of him. Exactly. Just what you said. His career's in front of him and um, anything can happen in football as well. You can pay 100 million for a boy. He could go out and get a serious injury, which I hope never happens, don't get me wrong. But that can happen. And then all of a sudden, things have you've lost that sort of type of money. Yeah, and the flip side of that is when we were talking about the class of 92 earlier, your Beckham, Scholes, Neville, cost Man United nothing. And you got exactly. loads of them. Which, again, let's talk about Williams, James, Wambasaka to an extent, but paying minimal and getting the best out of these players, that's the way to do it, isn't it? Absolutely. Now you're talking. I mean, people are that come through. I love to see, as you say, I love those kids coming through, costing the club nothing. And then all of a sudden having what you call at least 10 years at that yeah. football club. I think that's brilliant. Um, but as you say that, you know, over, over the years, that's, you don't really see a lot of that. But you've mentioned a few players there at United. And uh, I can see them being at the club for a number of years and doing really well coming through the ranks. I really can. Yeah, I hope so. Like you said, it goes cy um, cyclical, doesn't it? So hopefully there might be the nucleus of yeah. another Champions League winning team here at some point. Well, yeah, as, you, as you say, and, and to be fair, Ali, Ali's been quite brave, I think. Yeah. Quite brave, actually. You know, you talk about Sanchez, Lukaku, all these people who cost a lot of money. Well, Sanchez didn't cost a lot of money. He was involved in a, in a bit of a deal. But Lukaku, whatever... To, to get them out of the club and bring the like to stick with Ricefords and Greenwoods and you know these type of players, uh, very very brave and and hopefully hopefully it works out for them, which I think it will. It seems to be as we said earlier. It seems to be like just before lockdown happened, things were starting to take shape and really form as a great team, and then this virus just stopped it. So. I hope, like I said, I'm not a Manchester United fan, like full disclosure, I'm a Newcastle fan, but I do hope to see, I like great football and I like the idea of young talent, young British talent as well coming through as opposed to just buy this guy, buy this guy, buy this guy, the old Real Madrid mentality. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, obviously these big clubs that you mentioned, we have mentioned Liverpool, Man City, uh, Man United, who... Tottenham, I don't know. Tottenham haven't spent really a lot of money. From Levy, don't like really spending money. Uh, Arsenal, will be, I think, have to sort of spend again, sort of get up there, whatever. Yeah. But look at your club. Look at your club, Newcastle. You've got one of the best supports in the land. Yep, absolutely. And, and stick by the team unbelievably well. But it's about time, if you don't mind me saying, I don't know about this deal, which is going to go through. Newcastle need to be... With that support, what they've yeah. got, they need to be back on up there instead of talking about relegation. You need to be up the other end fighting for a top four, five, six, whatever place to get yeah. into Europe. Because I'm, everything's there by the yeah. football team. The city's behind, like you said, the support is unwavering. I would take an yeah. FA Cup at the moment. I would. The FA Cup still means something to me. I would take a solid cup run and competing for Europe. That would that would do me. I mean, even take over. Yeah, I'll take money. Yeah, league cup. You take a league cup as well. You take a league yeah. cup to to sort of get yourself to get yourself up and running and um, get them supporters singing and cheering again. Absolutely right. I mean, look at the um, the team in '96 who are still lauded as greats, and they didn't win anything. No. Well, I mean, that was under under Kevin Keegan. That was for me. That was great to watch, though. That yes. Was football flair players. Flair players, the crowd loved it, even though you didn't win anything, but it was good to watch. There was goals goes back going in, and you were letting goals in, but you were scoring goals. But yeah, it was good to watch. 
Goes back to what we said before, though, doesn't it? Like, your working man goes to watch the football at the end of the week, and it's like, did you win? No, we lost 3 2. Uh, who scored the two? Do you know what it was like? You got a game out of yep. it as opposed to. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, hope, well, hopefully, those days will come back to Newcastle. We can only hope. We can, we've had 13 years of just like, I think we're owed it. But then you look at these other clubs like Forest, massive club. Leeds, massive yeah. club. Blackburn are a big villa, a big clubs. And they're all still going like on the way well, down, I suppose, don't they? You talk, you talk about cycles, and you talk. You mentioned all those clubs, and every one of those clubs have been successful yeah. uh, in their time. All of a sudden, either it's bad ownership, bad managership, whatever, and they just fall away. Uh, I've seen it happen to so many unbelievable clubs. Um, look at Ipswich under Sir Bobby yes. Robson. Yeah, you know, winning, winning the UEFA Cup, winning this and winning that FA Cup. All of a sudden, look where they are now. You know, there's no given rate because what your history said you've done that absolutely. you can just take it for granted. You can't. No, I think you're absolutely right. And all those clubs, Forest to me would be the prime example of that. Um, I'm going to give Brian yeah, a little absolutely. shout out as well because Brian Keenan just said Newcastle would take an egg cup at the moment. And um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if we won it fair and square, yeah. Man. <laughs> Right, Sammy, we come, we've got about five minutes left. So um, I'm going to ask you this. Um, for a player that comes to Manchester United, what is the difference playing for Man United than playing for another club? What do you have to bring to the table to become a Manchester United legend? Well, I mean, as I tried to say before, you, 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 you've got to have a little bit of uh, well belief in, your, in yourself and in, in your ability, and you've got to be able to handle expectations at the club and the history that's behind the club uh, and uh, you know this is this is what I've tried to say to you before with I can remember I'll, I'll make this quick uh, a lovely lad great footballer called Gary Bertels okay did unbelievable for Nottingham Forest won the European yeah. Cup won the league championship brilliant I've room with Gary got on very well William when he came to United he Tried his socks off and nothing happened for him. Nothing happened for 30 odd games. Couldn't hit a barn door. And, uh, you know, we would say, What's going on? And he said, I don't know. I, I, I just can't do it. And that's happened to so many players. I think Alan Brazil, Alan Brazil was another one from, uh, did, did fantastic at Ipswich, came to United, but didn't really hit it off. There's been so many players that's come, great with other clubs, but at United, either it's been, as I say, a little bit fear or whatever. I can't put my hand on it, but you've got to have a little bit of. Uh, obviously, you need a bit of luck as well. Don't get me wrong, uh, but you need you need belief and have a little bit of battle to stand up to expectations. I'm glad you mentioned Gary Bertles actually, because I always liked him as a footballer. Like he played for England a couple of times as well. Like oh, he, was... he he tried Stryker. his socks off, you know, yeah. great lad. Great lad. And when he was at Nuts Forest, he was one of the main men yeah. at Nuts Forest. It, he yes. did ever so well on... Oh, hang on. We seem to have lost some... Oh, there he is. We're back. We're back. <laughs> Are you there, man? Um, I think we may just have lost Sammy, but that's um, we're coming up to the close of the show anyway. So we've had an hour with Sammy McElroy. Um, I think... Oh. We are, we're getting in. Hey, there you are, mate. There you are. Um, all good. Benji Smith Sorry just been on. That. It's no problem whatsoever. These things happen. These things happen. Um, Benji Smith's mentioned another one. Sanchez, great at Arsenal, nothing at United. And yet, Arsenal, again, you would expect the same level of expectation because they're our big club. I couldn't believe that. When Sanchez came to the Old Trafford, I was absolutely thinking this is going to be a fantastic move. This is yeah, going to yeah, be yeah. fantastic. All of a sudden, I'm looking at a different player and I still can't put my finger on it. This is what I'm trying to say to you. He's come and he's thinking, aye, aye, this ain't Arsenal. I could do everything right at Arsenal. I could do this. Now, all of a sudden, people expect me to be a superstar and, I, and he can't really handle it. And th that's a great example, Sanchez. Yeah, brilliant example. One final question then, Sammy, before we let you go. It's from Owen Parks. Are you superstitious? 
And if so, what was the most, most random superstition of anybody that you played with or of your own? What I used to do, believe it or not, as a player, um, every game, home or away, I got when we got changed, I always used to put my shorts on last before it went out. Once the bell went, five to three, three o'clock kickoff, I would just put I put my socks on, obviously jock strap shirt, uh, boots, and then right at the end, last minute, I put my shorts on, and I did that all my career. For some reason, uh, maybe that's the answer that's to that succeed Man United. Maybe that's what all these other players <laughs> are missing out on. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that was my superstition. Just putting my football shorts on last before we went down at the bell. That, that's what I did all my career. Cool. Well, I hope that answers the question, Owen. Um, Sammy, that brings us bang on to the hour. I want to thank you so much for um, being a part of the show. We never got to talk about your dream team, but. I think we've had a great conversation anyway, and I hope we've answered all of the questions that all of the people wanted. So on behalf of Superstar Speakers, Sammy McElroy, thank you so much for joining us here this evening. 